Dear delegates and participants from SARC member state, welcome to you to third day of the training on digitizing industrial motor system for energy efficiency. In the previous two days, uh, I hope we have learned a lot from a four eminent speaker. Today, there are three resource person, uh, Mr. Dr. Professor India Bejini from Switzerland, then Mr. Liu Ren from CNS, CNIS China, and third one is Mr. Poli Taylor from ESA. I'll give their introduction before the start of their uh, session. So now I would like to request Dr. Bejini uh, uh, for the presentation. So to uh, to give his, him uh, his short introduction, Professor Andrea Bezini received PhD in Electrical Engineering from ETH Zurich, Switzerland in 1996 and completed the Master uh, uh, in Technology Enterprises at IMD in 2002. He is Professor for Industrial Power Electronics at Bonn University of Applied Science since 1996 and was visiting professor at GM Advanced Technology Center in 2003. Currently, Dr. Bezini is head of the BFHCSEM Energy Storage Research Center and deputy head of the Swiss Competence Center for Energy Research Mobility. Since 2015, he is member of the Federal Energy Research Commission and since 2017, he is member of for electric motor system NX for Switzerland. Uh, Mr. Vajini, the floor is yours, please. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be uh, here with you, virtually uh, with you. Uh, and I hope that um, I can bring in the next, uh, I think it's like roughly an hour or so, I bring you closer to the topic of uh, variable frequency drives and motor system savings potential. And we are especially today looking at the system in itself, so the complete drive system, motors, and the variable frequency drives. Just to make sure you see the intro slide now, and I switch now, you see uh, the slide about speakers. Huh? Um, <clears throat> well, we heard about my introduction already. Um, as mentioned, I'm a member of the IEC Technical Committee 2. Uh, work Group 28 and Work Group 31, and the IEC uh, 22G, Work Group 18, who's dealing with uh, efficiency measurements of inverters, uh, industrial drives. Um, and we just released now the second committee draft for the new um, IEC 61800 9 2, who actually deals with uh, the efficiency classification of industrial drives. Um, two slides about my lab. My lab, I'm heading the uh, lab for electric machines and industrial drives, and uh, we have uh, quite good equipment for uh, electric machine test benches. I'm able uh, to test between 0.1 up to 60 kilowatts. Uh, you can see here a typical test bench setup where we have the load machine, the machine on the test, we see here the inverter, we see some uh, measurement equipment. Um, we can measure electrical uh, um, values as well as mechanical values. So we have torque meters, as you can see here, who measure actually the torque in a range from 0.2 to 500. 500 would be the bigger uh, test bench we see here. Everything is automated. You can see here a setup. Um, we can run tests according to IEC standards, where we measure the efficiency points as they have been declared in the standards itself. We measure, for example, the input power to the inverter. Here's the device on the test using a, a three-phase um, power analyzer. We measure the output side, so three-phase current and three voltages here. You could do it with two currents and two voltages only. Um, in a second uh, power analyzer and we collect the data and we do post-processing also uh, fully automatically. Um, so this puts me in a position since uh, a few years now um, 
doing continuously research on the industrial drives market with a special focus on efficiency um, and the application in industrial applications. So what I want to discuss with you today is, is this content here. We, we quickly are looking over the definition of motor-driven unit. Um, so what is actually, if I say motor-driven unit, which are the components? Um, and then we switch uh, to the uh, individual components. I will look first at the motor itself, talk about, about the IEC standards for efficiency measurements, uh, look at what can we do to optimize losses in the motor um, before we then go to inverters, so industrial drives, uh, some topology introduction here, also how it works and what is to be expected in this field in the future, before we then go to basically a motor-driven system. And I took one example, especially the um, uh, variable frequency drive plus pump and see what is the energy saving potential there and why adjustable speed drive systems makes a lot of sense there. This uh, we will wrap up with some conclusions and a small example as well as some questions at the end. So let's talk about the um, terminology on if we talk about motor driven units what do we mean uh, with it. There is a uh, definition which was done by uh, Conrad Brunner also and others at the IEC which says that the motor driven unit um, converts basically electric power into rotational mechanical power and uh, may consist of the following individual components. So we have at the entrance here we have the power supply feeding electric power into the motor driven unit uh, where a variable frequency drive will convert um, the fixed form uh, power supply into a variable form uh, power supply with adjustable frequency and adjustable voltage, feeding a motor and the motor acts as an electromechanical conversion. Uh, so it converts electric power into mechanical power and drives a mechanical equipment, which can be often be a um, a gearbox or a clutch or a belt and at the end of this mechanical equipment we have then the uh, application uh, which can be a pump, a fan, a compressor or a belt or a trans uh, conveyor for transporting uh, goods and that's part of the um, um, let's say industrial process uh, where you either want to have flow or motion uh, uh, for your process in itself. So the motor driven unit is much more than just the motor, it's much more than just the, the inverter, it's really the complete system setup which goes into your uh, industrial process. To give you uh, an even more uh, descriptive um, view of, of such motor driven units, you see here again, grey, the motor driven units as we discussed before, and you see beforehand, you see uh, basically the power supply. In most industrial application, this consists of the power supply, which means the AC mains um, feeding into your grid. So this could go over uh, some power equipment like transformers or switch gears. And finally, you have the input section into your controls. The controls meaning an equipment which is able to control the electric power flow there can be starters, uh, mostly we're talking today about variable speed drives, so industrial inverters, power electronics, who convert the electric um, fixed frequency and fixed voltage at the input here into a variable frequency and variable voltage at the output here. This feeds into the motor as the main electromechanical conversion unit. It converts the electric power into mechanical power and then the shaft as the output of the motor is connected to some coupling or mechanical transmission unit. And uh, you see here what is possible, pulley, chain, uh, brake, clutch as additional mechanical elements can be here. Really often you see some gears or if you use the speed directly, so there's some coupling. And then you have the driven equipment and the driven equipment depends strongly on what you wanna do can be a production machine where you have to move, for example, the arm of, uh, of a robot. It can be the arm of a uh, milling machine. It can be the 
uh, the, the, the head of a milling machine. But often you have uh, you want to move liquids or air, so pumps and fans, uh, compressors are, are a main application for such systems, or you just use a conveyor, uh, cranes uh, to actually move goods around. So this is the driven equipment, and this actually is embedded then in a process. The process itself can have additional components. In the case of pumps, uh, the process itself is, for example, all the tubes and pipings where the, the liquids is, is flowing through, which actually has a resistance. Um, you have also some process components like a wall for throttles. Um, and they are actually then uh, adding to the resistance or the load torque for your motor driven unit. Why is it so important <clears throat> to talk about that? I will show you later on that uh, electric motors or such motor driven units, they account for about uh, half of the world's electrical energy consumption. And um, they're a, a, a rather a costly um, item in your operation. Electricity costs will dominate uh, life cycle costs of uh, such system. So therefore, um, a optimized, uh, let's say, setup of such a system is of most important value for um, total uh, operational cost. Um, here, just an example of such a motor-driven unit uh, in the form of a pump. As you can see here, you have the uh, inverter, power electronics. Um, it can be on top as it's done here, but it can also be separated from the motor. Um, this is uh, roughly a 7.5 kilowatt uh, pump, so it's actually possible to put the inverter on top of the motor. The motor itself here uh, has a coupling. As you can see here, this part would be then the mechanical coupling, and it couples here a centrifugal pump. There's some additional equipment measuring the input and out uh, flow. Uh, pressure, uh, which allows you some better knowledge of the process variables and to detect if there is any problems like cavitation in the pump itself. Um, but this is mainly, as you can see here, that would be or that would be a motor driven unit uh, with all the components we saw before. Now, as I told you already, um, motors um, actually are really uh, responsible for 50% of uh, total electric energy consumption worldwide. Um, you can actually split the, these 50% up in industrial electric motors. So basically, uh, motors driven inside motor driven units um, in, in industrial applications. And you have uh, some others, which we also would like to include here, for example, uh, motors in commercial or residential, uh, even agriculture. They, they're very similar in that sense uh, because they're, for example, uh, blowers or uh, fans uh, for commercial applications. In residentials, you have uh, also a lot of uh, fans and pumps as well as agricultures, for example, for uh, drying up the hay, for example. Uh, and then we have naturally also transport, so we're talking about railways in some countries which are have a completely electrified railway. Um, it's not including um, electric mobility, as this is a rather new um, uh, field growing up, but electric mobility in the future will have a rather large share of electric consumption too. So improving the efficiency of your motor-driven unit um, is of main importance and as you can see it's not only uh, a question on how do we actually use our resources most meaningful um, as you know we're trying to actually get to net zero co2 in the future as, as goal 2050 which means you have to have a higher degree of electrification um, getting away from fossil fuels means a higher amount of electrification and therefore, you have to be sure that um, the amount of electricity is used in a responsible and energy efficient way. Um, but also for you as a user of electric motor driven systems, um, if you look on uh, total life cycle costs, you will see that actually the investment cost at the beginning, who's dominating most of the discussions between the supplier and, and the user, 
uh, at the beginning to, to actually get the cheapest motor or the cheapest inverter is, is, is a wrong perspective. As you can see here that about 96% of the total uh, lifelong costs are uh, really tied to electricity costs. Um, and it means that if I can get a drive which is a 10% or a 15% higher efficiency, um, this will actually have a huge impact on my total cost. The uh, unfortunately delayed nature of this cost benefit, uh, as, as you have to pay upfront the investment costs, but the, the maintenance or the, the operational costs will come later. Uh, this delay in, in return is, is actually uh, still a problem today as people will optimize here the investment costs over efficiency. But if you really take into account total life cycle cost, then you, you see that this, there is a, a really a case to be made for energy efficient motor driven unit. Now, if we look at the total numbers of motors which are used, you will see that uh, we have quite a large amount of motors who are actually used direct online, 88%. Um, and we have about 12% of uh, VFD uh, driven motor systems. Uh, although I have to say that this part is continuously increasing. Huh? It is clear uh, that using motors plus a variable frequency drive will increase basically your investment costs, its added costs. Uh, so you always have to show and, and clearly make the case for energy savings through a variable frequency drive by adjustable speed. Um, and that's uh, what you want to show. And then you can actually calculate the costs of higher investment versus the uh, long-term operating costs. Also, from an energy standpoint of view, there's still a lot of application which will not require you to change the speed of the application in itself. Um, therefore, a direct online solution with a high efficient motor might still be the better solution. So we don't expect actually that uh, in the future variable frequency drive will take over 100% of all motor driven units. There are still some very good cases to be made for direct online. But you always have to look at the process itself, look if the process itself will allow to, to actually change the speed. And if that's the case, then you should really um, look into using uh, variable frequency drives. Now, if we look now at the different components in itself, um, and I'd like to start with the motor, um, then um, if you look at the uh, let's say standardization world, um, just to give you a hint, how do you, you get actually to understand how is efficiency measured and defined? What are efficiency classes? It's good to get an overview. And, and here is a, another uh, slide, which has been made by Konrad Brunner once, uh, which shows really nicely the scope of different IEC standards and uh, what they're actually dealing with. So if it's efficiency testing or classification. So if you want to understand the different IE classes and how the IE classes um, are defined for motors, you would go to IEC 60034-30-1. But if you want to know how to test it, then it's IEC 60034-2-1. And if you want to test motors who are driven by variable frequency drives, there's a dash two dash three of the same standard here. Um, and if you want to test the motors, as I said before, this is IEC 61800-9-2. There is a classification and testing definition in itself, and also the complete power driven system uh, with variable frequency drive and motors is defined in this, um, in this standard here. So this is basically the background on how we define efficiencies for motor driven units, being it for the motor alone, being it for the variable frequency drive alone, or being for the complete um, power driven system. And uh, if we stay now in the world of motors, um, the most well-known uh, classification is the so-called efficiency classes IE1 to IE4. Um, these are the codes, as I said before, they are, they are actually defined in the IC standard 60034-30-1. 
and they are valid between uh, about 120 watts up to 1000 kilowatts industrial drives two to eight poles uh, and they define basically the efficiency which are required over a, uh, the output power and as you can see here the efficiency class starts with IE1 which is defined as standard efficiency class IE2, IE3, IE4 and as you uh, well might know um, a lot of countries actually have forbidden the uh, the sale of low efficiency motors. So in Switzerland, for example, you, you're obliged to buy IE3 motors if you buy a new motor. Um, and uh, since the middle of this year, and uh, only uh, if you use an IE2 motor together with a variable frequency drive, and if the total system actually will add to um, considerable energy savings, you're allowed still to buy IE2. But you cannot run an IE2 motor directly on. Um, just to give you an idea, uh, what is the energy saving you can actually realize um, when you change your motors from um, one efficiency class to the other, um, you see this um, graph here. It's only from 120 watts to 75 kilowatts, um, but the, the part actually, if you look at energy uh, and the number of motors, so energy turnover, which is done by by motors, so this 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 range is actually really lion share. You have a lot of this type of motors, and they actually turn around a lot of energy. Um, and as you can see here now, the orange box shows you the energy saving if you switch from an IE1 to an IE2 motor. So let's take the example of a 2.2 uh, motor here. Um, oh, sorry, <clears throat> a 2.2 motor. If I switch from uh, IE1 to IE2, I will have roughly about minus 6% of energy savings. Uh, if I would switch from IE2 to IE3, that's the gray bar, I have roughly, uh, I would say, about uh, 3% of additional uh, savings. And from IE3 to IE4, um, this would add here another uh, 4%. So that I probably end up with uh, somewhere around 11 to 12 percent. Now, this means that if I switch from IE1 to IE4, I have a total of 11 percent of, of energy savings. So that can give you a hint on, on what is possible by just changing the motor drive, the motor in itself. Um, <clears throat> it is clear that the efficiency gains are much higher in this small power motors. Uh, but it also has to be said that the total turnover in energy of these small motors is not as big as from the bigger ones here. So um, even if you have only, as you can see here, a total gain of 6%, because the amount of energy which you are actually turning over during a year will give you a higher return of investment here in, in, uh, in US dollars or Swiss francs, whatever you take as a calculation. Now, to understand a bit better how these motors can be improved, we look quickly into the setup of these motors. Um, as you can see here, uh, typically industrial drives consist of a uh, multipole AC induction motor. Um, <clears throat> as you can see, AC induction means it's a three phase winding, which is here in the stator. As you can see here, these are copper wires. Um, and they're uh, wound into a stator core, which basically uh, consists of uh, some laminations, so uh, simple sheet metals uh, stacked on top of each other. The thickness of these sheet metals is about 0.5 to 0.7 millimeters. The rotor, as you can see here, consists basically of the same. So you have also um, <clears throat> here laminations, and then inside these laminations, and at the end you have aluminum pressed, um, uh, die-casted aluminum, uh, which basically have here a rotor winding consisting of bars from the end to the top here, and then this short circuit ring. And now the torque in this machine is basically generated by the interaction of the magnetic field generated by the stator, and the electric mode, uh, the electric currents running inside the rotor, and um, the electric currents are transformed from the stator side also to the rotor side. So, 
um, I see in the stator, I see the rotor current, like in a transformer reflected, as well as the magnetizing currents. It means that I have losses. I have losses in the windings. As soon as you have a current inside a copper winding, you have losses, and I have losses in the rotor. Here I have aluminum bar losses inside the rotor. As you can see, to actually, whenever you have losses, you have a heat development, which means that the stator here will um, heat up. <clears throat> there is some cooling uh, given by convection, natural convection, but to actually improve the cooling performance, uh, normal industrial drives are actually self-cooled. So on the shaft, which looks here on the backside a little bit out, you have a fan with a fan cover and as soon as the motor drives, uh, this fan will actually then push air on the outside and you have forced uh, convection, improving basically the cooling of this motor. Now, uh, looking at the losses in a uh, induction motor, you can actually say, okay, I have, an, uh, and then that's a typical, uh, we'll see this later on, uh, display on how you can uh, show how the electric input power is converted to the output power. In this case, it's mechanical output power. Um, you basically draw here the input and then you have all the losses. And as you can see here, if I have total electric input, I have copper losses. So I have to cover these losses too. Then I have what is called core losses. They're related to the magnetization of the stator and as well as the rotor core. I have some mechanical losses, the mechanical losses coming from the fan, for example, which is a resistance, but also from the bearings. And I have additional stray losses, um, which account for the difference between uh, the output losses and all the input losses. Um, and there are certain ways how you actually can improve these losses in the sense of reduce naturally. Um, so in, if you want to reduce core losses, uh, and you see here the amount of uh, the, the percentage of the core losses to the total losses. So this is a considerable. Uh, that should be probably like 5 to 15, sorry, not 15 to 15. But um, you can actually improve, if you go back, the quality of the steel sheets here. You can actually make them thinner. Um, then you reduce the magnetic losses. Uh, windage uh, and friction losses, um, there's a lot of uh, to be gained using lower friction bearings or improved the fan design. The stator losses are mostly related to um, I square R losses, so uh, the losses due to the resistance of the winding. So you can increase the volume of the copper wire, um, reducing the stator resistance and therefore you can have lower losses and the same goes naturally in the rotor but here you have um, the bars and the bars they're normally made out of aluminum and if you want to reduce the losses there you increase the size of the rotor conductive bars or you could also uh, replace aluminum rotor bars with copper rotor bars with added cost but it would give you um, the advantage of lower losses. Um, <clears throat> there has been a lot recently uh, of development of loss optimized motors and um, there, today you, you see there's a lot of optimized um, motor technologies available and uh, to start with there has been a lot done uh, by optimizing AC induction motors. So as I just showed before you can actually uh, get a motor, an AC induction motor from a, a low efficiency class to a higher efficiency class, at least up to IE3 without bigger problems, without changing the size, the outside size of the motor by improving some of the design factors, by adding more copper, by adding um, more aluminum in the rotor and uh, by optimizing, for example, the fine design. So this is, if you look at that, I can increase some of the efficiency on this axis here um, at a very low cost. And I think this is the way uh, a lot of industry has been doing in the last uh, 10 to 15 years, uh, improving their existing designs uh, and getting them from uh, no name or no label efficiency up to level three. It is difficult to get with 
standard designs up to IE4. Uh, if you want to go to IE4 path, uh, there is the possibility that you replace, and you can see here, these copper bars are made out of aluminum. That's because they're white here, and these are made out of copper, so they're yellow. So adding copper rotor bars is a way how you can in actually increase the efficiency, the losses in the rotor, which are also uh, quite dominating as we have seen before let's go back you see here rotor losses can be up to one fourth of total losses so uh, i can actually with some added costs i can actually increase the efficiency so it's a little bit more on the right here um, and then we have uh, all the others more uh, advanced motors um, which are all actually are built as synchronous machines, um, <clears throat> avoiding basically the losses in the rotor due to slip, so the difference in frequency of the rotor towards the um, stator. And um, there have been a lot of publications. Naturally, there were uh, at the beginning right away the permanent magnet motors as a standard solution uh, available. As you can see, they will get you highest efficiency, but also with the highest cost and um, due to basically the, the cost of the permanent magnets. And uh, there have been uh, quite some activities to basically reduce the amount of magnets. Uh, as you can see, the stator always looks more or less the same as a three-phase stator, but reducing the amount of magnets using flux concentration technologies um, uh, you can actually get a very high efficiency too uh, with a little bit lower cost and that's what we call the IPM machines um, and, and that's where a lot of uh, IE4, even IE5 machines are to be found today. Um, if you go then a little bit further down you see uh, there's this machine which is called synchronous reluctance motor so there's no magnet inside here, this rotor, but as you can see, the rotor has a lot of um, magnetic barriers, which means they're, they're air holes. Uh, there's a structure here. So what is black is actually just cut out of the rotor laminations, in, in, meaning that they're not filled with magnetically conductive material. And they are actually making a, um, in, in one direction, a, a clear magnetic resistance and in the other direction you would have a lower resistance and the, um, the difference in magnetic resistance over the circumference of the rotor makes that you can create here a reluctance torque with the, the currents in the stator and without having any um, currents in the rotor. So basically you can imagine that this is like you have a, a piece of steel inside the magnetic field and the piece of steel like the needle of a compass will also always go to the direction of the magnetic field. So if I have a turning magnetic field, so the rotor will follow the turning magnetic field, which means it's a synchronous motor and it has, if you look at it naturally, very low cost on the motor side. It will require, though, a higher uh, inverter uh, because the current capability has to be higher because of the power factor of this machine, which is lower, requires higher phase currents. And recently, there has been uh, from ABB and some other companies the um, an, an mix between permanent magnet motors and uh, synchronous reluctance motors. So the PMA SRM or permanent magnet assisted synchronous reluctance motor, uh, which basically adds uh, to the reluctance torque a little bit of magnetic torque, and that's uh, increasing um, the efficiency with a moderate amount of increased costs. So today we are seeing basically uh, a lot of um, development in this field to get higher efficiencies. Tula, you have a question or you just switched on your camera? Sorry. No, no question. Okay. No question, yeah. Good. So, um, <clears throat> finally, uh, and take this as an uh, input. So, we can increase the efficiency of the motors uh, by going to synchronous motors using either permanent magnets, so PMM here, 
And as you see, this PMM motors, this is the solid green line, has a much higher efficiency than the asynchronous machine here, which is the orange uh, fixed line. Um, but I can run on, on direct speed, I can run this machine, and I cannot run the permanent magnet machine without the frequency inverter. So actually, I would have to take into account the inverter. As you can see here, this is the, the dashed line here. So that would be a permanent magnet motor plus inverter. As you can see, it's still higher than the direct online AC motor. Um, but uh, <clears throat> what is interesting is if you look at the switched reluctance motor, including the frequency, we will get actually the same performance as a direct online AC induction motor. And also the, the AC induction motor with inverter still has a quite good uh, overall efficiency, as you can see here. But, um, sorry, as you have to take with you that uh, variable frequency drives adds between 3 to 4% of additional losses to the nominal point. And only if you have actually additional energy savings by modulating the speed in your application, you will have an advantage by using a frequency drive. So, we were talking now a lot about inverters, and so it's it's time that we have a look into the inverter technologies and what we can do with them, and uh, how how this is actually looked at. And you see here, I give you the power-driven system. Uh, you have a feeding section. Um, so that's the inverter here. You have some auxiliaries that can be fans or so. Then you have the so-called basic drive module. So that's the power electronics. And then you have, again, at the output, some auxiliaries that can be, for example, a filter. So that's the complete drive module. Um, often, when you buy a, an inverter like this, it's only the basic drive model. So it, it, there's no input or no output filters, as, which are here the auxiliaries. And the feeding section, most of the time, is actually a very simple uh, rectifier. Um, the, if you if you look at the setup and and this is power electronics, so we have basically an input section which is um, could be a line choke, uh, some rectifier. As a simple example, we have a DC link. So we have the AC from the grid, alternative current which is converted through the rectifier into a DC uh, link voltage bus. You have capacitors here which basically uh, stabilize the DC link. Sometimes you have here a uh, brake resistor. And then you have the power stage, which converts the DC voltage of the DC link, again, to a three-phase uh, variable frequency, variable uh, amplitude output here for the motors. Um, just a little bit of technology in that sense. Um, if, if you look at how the output section is done, um, and we don't have to go more into detail afterwards, almost all inverters have the same output section. It consists of six power semiconductor switches, um, which basically can take this point. And if you switch T1 on, then uh, you have the uh, DC link voltage connected to this phase. If you switch T2 on and T1 off, then you have the zero volts or the negative side of the DC link connected to this, this uh, voltage. It means that if I look with a voltage measurement equipment at this point here, I will only see two levels. I will see full DC link voltage or zero volts at this input. Um, <clears throat> there is an advantage in using this semiconductors in pure switching mode. Switching mode means that I'm only having um, the lowest amount of possible losses. Um, I actually only have losses when I switch on. As you can see here, switch on means that the current red will increase while the voltage drop across the device will decrease. So I will have some switching losses as you can see here and then during the on time, which means during the time, uh, let's say T1 as before is switched on and there is some current flowing from the DC link into the motor phase A here, I will have the lowest possible uh, 
conducting uh, resistance. And then I switch off. Switching off means I actually decrease the current down to zero. And because most of the time when you actually switch off, then this middle point goes to uh, the low side. So it's zero. So the voltage of the switch will actually increase again. So this is the blocking voltage. Again, switching off will add some uh, losses. And now if you see, um, you have to do this once with uh, uh, during a switch on. You have losses, you have conducting losses during the on period, and you have uh, losses during the switch off period. And now how, how many times do we actually switch on and switch off these switches? This can be seen here. Um, this is the example of a very low switching frequency. Um, you see here, this is the output voltage. So again, if I switch the upper side switch on, I will have uh, voltage, full voltage of the DC link on the outside. If I switch off, then I will have the negative voltage or zero of the DC link here on this side. And as you can see now, what I will do is I will switch this with a pulse width modulation. So um, the on time will vary. Uh, if I have a long on time here, you see a long time switched on, short, sorry, so shortly switched off, uh, I will vary this and then I will only switch on for a small time and a very long time off time. Uh, if I will, if I make, basically if I do a filter of the signal, I, you see that the fundamental of this signal is then again my sinusoidal output. The motor itself acts actually as a low pass filter with its uh, inductance. And for the motor itself, a signal like the blue signal here will at the end look like a green signal. It will apply a sinusoidal voltage. The difference between the sinusoidal voltage and the blue voltage um, leads to what we call current ripple. So this is the, the phase current, as you can see here. It is already sinusoidal because it mainly sees uh, the fundamental of this output signal of the inverter, but due to the switch on, switch off, you will have, as you can see here, also some uh, current ripple. And this current ripple will add actually additional losses to uh, the motor itself. Uh, so there is a slightly reduced efficiency in the motor due to higher harmonic losses which you have also to take into account if you do complete system design. Now, as I said, the output section looks always more or less the same. The input section, here the example of an input three-phase rectifier, uh, can be quite different depending on uh, what are your goals. Huh? Uh, the, the idea of the input section is always that you have a three-phase alternative current supply and you have to convert it um, uh, into a DC link or a DC voltage, which is basically here also um, filtered and, and maintains that stable with uh, DC link capacitors. Um, <clears throat> now, if the motor is actually used as a generator and you want to feed back uh, energy from the motor into the mains, you see that actually a normal diode rectifier will not be able to do this. Uh, one uh, simple solution is adding a DC brake resistor, so which basically takes the power which is fed from the motor into this DC link capacitor, and then it breaks and just generates heat. This is not what you want in an energy efficient drive, but it's often a very um, cost effective solution naturally. Um, what are other possibilities and what are the different operating, uh, let's say, characteristics? Here again, the uh, line choke and rectifier section as before. And um, what is important to see is uh, blue is the line voltage huh, from one phase here. And red is basically the line current, as you can see here. Um, the, 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 the current is slightly uh, filtered because of the line choke. Uh, but it still has very clear two um, conducting segments. Huh? These are the total 120 degrees or 2, two times 60 here, uh, where the um, diode is conducting. And 
Therefore, the total power factor is, is roughly 0.7. So there is um, there's a disadvantage. You have to over-design basically the input feeder section. You have some um, feedback into the grid in the sense of harmonics, which uh, is, is uh, often not uh, desired. Huh? And because if you actually will use uh, regenerative braking out of dynamics requirement, for example, um, you will have to use a large braking resistor. There are some other solutions. Uh, one is uh, the fundamental frequency front end, uh, where you have basically here switched elements, so not diodes, but you have uh, semiconductors, but they are actually switched with the frequency of the grid, so quite uh, low switching losses here. Um, and they basically, whenever the, the line voltage here is positive, this switch is uh, feeding through um, the voltage to the DC link. Uh, if it's negative, then uh, the lower side uh, switch is switched on. So as you can see, these two switches operated with a frequency of about 50 Hertz. Um, uh, this will give you a current like you see here. Um, <clears throat> There's an approximately block-shaped input current. Um, the power factor can be close to one, and uh, you, you don't need an input choke. Uh, and what is possible, you can actually, because you can switch it on, you also do some uh, regenerative braking. Um, if you wanna, uh, or if, if you have higher requirements regarding the quality of your current from the grid, feeding in or actually getting uh, to supply the motor, then um, you actually use what is called the active front end. So again, there are six uh, semiconductors. So basically, as you can see here, this is a back-to-back -back, uh, configuration of two inverters, one at the input, one at the output. Uh, but now the difference to the fundamental frequency um, front end is that the active front end is having higher switching frequency. So basically it does the same as we have seen before with the motor inverter. It switches and modulates the pulse width of the on time in a fashion that basically the current will again look uh, very sinusoidal with a low amount of uh, current ripple. Here there's a high switching frequency. We're talking about four to eight kilohertz. Um, there is regenerative capability. You can move power from left to right or right to left, and you need uh, only a small uh, high frequency line choke. So this is uh, typically uh, set up for regenerative uh, inverter drives, uh, but you have to be very careful to see if it's, it's, it's actually necessary because sure, this regenerative front end here um, makes it possible to feed some energy back into the line, but the additional losses um, can actually, during the motoring, uh, create um, a lower efficiency so that you have to be careful and, and wait in if the amount of regenerative braking energy or regenerative feeding into the grid energy will cover the additional losses of your input section. And um, <clears throat> the, uh, what's the difference? Oh, sorry. Um, the act, there's a, a, another, and I just mentioned this for completion, uh, for an active front end, is a, is a matrix inverter. Um, uh, there is uh, Askawa, for example, who's actually uh, industrializing a uh, matrix inverter, which is a very hot topic in research or for very high power uh, inverters, but you can buy uh, some industrial inverters using uh, matrix inverter. So it's a, it's basically a, a um, capacity-less um, motor. Uh, it has no DC link in that sense. It's just an input filter. And then you have a, an array of switches and you use these switches just to uh, take sections out of the input frequency or input voltage uh, and you switch then uh, these parts to the motor. Um, it is regenerative capable, so you can actually break. Um, it has um, low losses, uh, and especially what you can do at, at uh, when you run your motor at 50 Hertz uh, supply frequency, 
then uh, you can actually also switch uh, two connectors and you have then again like um, the, the, the AC line on the motor. This can only be done with a conventional uh, variable frequency drive if you have additionally a bypass contactor, which adds cost, which you have here in the matrix inverter uh, added. The um, power factor is close to one. Um, and um, the disadvantage here is the added cost due to higher amount of switches. Um, <clears throat> So to summarize here, you have uh, basically the four input sections and from the, um, the, the, the four criteria. So regenerative capability, as you can see, diode rectifier uh, has, has no regenerative capability, but the losses are very low. Um, so this is an advantage compared to the uh, active front end as well as the matrix inverters. Um, the harmonics are higher. Um, whereas the fundamental uh, front end here uh, has uh, lower harmonics, um, but not as good as an active front end, for example. But as you can see here, cost of a diode bridge inverter is much uh, lower than uh, the other topologies, so it needs some careful um, design choices if you want to go for a regenerative braking um, drive. And to finalize a little bit uh, here, this uh, chapter, two remaining slides, is about cost of efficiency increase um, in motors versus uh, inverters. As I showed you at the beginning, inverters have a very high efficiency in any way. They're only adding 3 to 4% losses, so it means that you have 96 to 97% of efficiency. Um, and the efficiency doesn't drop so uh, dramatically at the lower uh, part load, um, not uh, as it is done in, in drives, in motors. But you also see that I can actually increase um, or decrease the losses from, let's say, nine to four. So I get about uh, quite a, uh, I can half basically huh, from nine. Uh, to four, I can more than half the losses by just adding about 20% of costs. And uh, you can calculate with this uh, rather easily um, uh, how much savings you have, half the losses by only 20% of the investment costs. And now you have to take into account that energy costs is 96% of total life cycle costs and investment costs about 2%. Whereas in the inverter, uh, as you can see, <clears throat> they're already at a very low, so 97, 97.5. This is typically converter losses. And uh, this is just to show you, if I, if I choose to change the motor from IE3 to IE4, I can actually uh, have more than half of a reduction uh, of the converter losses. So, um, and, and, and that would be uh, actually be uh, more costly than just this step of uh, IE3 to IE4. So if you want in a, in a motor-driven system, actually add um, efficiency, first look at the motor, uh, because that's probably where you have a very cost-efficient way by just increasing the efficiency class of the motor, um, and then you have a lot of gain for not so much money. So after having now talked about motors and inverters, I'd like to talk about the application itself and what is the advantage of using motor-driven uh, units. <clears throat> so what's the application advantage? Uh, I will make this uh, for an example uh, with a variable frequency drive plus a pump, but uh, naturally um, there are a lot of other um, <clears throat> applications. And all the applications have different torque speed uh, characteristics. So this is a uh, elevator, for example, as you have to lift a weight, the torque basically uh, for a given speed is always constant. And um, if you increase the speed, then basically you have a linear relation between um, uh, the speed and your power. 
Um, then you have uh, some uh, foil transportation here, as well as here some conveyors. Um, and they both have uh, very specific um, torque characteristics. Um, that is, for example, the torque increases with the speed here, uh, whereas here you've got a 1 over n relation between speed and torque because uh, the higher the speed, uh, then you've got the um, the, the, ra the, 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 the radius coming down, so there's a decrease in torque, um, which means that you have a constant power here, whereas here you have the power getting in square. Uh, and what I would like for further uh, discussions now take with me is the fan or pump application, where the torque basically is uh, proportional to the square of the, the speed, huh? the, the mass of uh, volume air or the mass of uh, discharge, water discharge, for example, uh, makes it that you have a square relationship between speed and torque. And as a consequence, you have almost a cubic relation or you have a cubic relationship between power and speed. Huh? And uh, <clears throat> this is quite interesting because as you can see, if I reduce uh, for example, the speed, which is often proportional to the flow, um, then uh, I actually have a, a reduction in torque, which is square, and I have a reduction in power, which is cubic. Now, let's have a look at what does this mean in typically application of a pump. And the traditional pump-driven system would look like this. You have a, a constant frequency supply. Uh, and you have a direct online AC induction motor, so self-starting, all the advantages you want to have, but it means that it runs at a certain speed. Let's say it's a four-pole motor, so the average speed would be around 1450 to 1470 RPM, and it drives at essentially constant speed a pump. If you want to actually control the discharge of the pump, being it uh, <clears throat> liquids, you will need to add some throttling valves. The throttling valves can be here at the output, so that's an outlet valve, or it can be here at the inlet, so it would be an inlet valve. What you add basically is just you increase the resistance of your system here, and therefore you, you will reduce the amount of, um, of this, of water flow or air flow, um, and uh, basically you generate additional heat. Huh? Um, it is not amenable to automation. I would say it's not fully true. Uh, you can have small motors here controlling basically the uh, valve, um, and therefore you find this typically in any uh, central heating in a house uh, with um, thermostats in the room, for example. Um, now, what we propose um, to improve the efficiency naturally is that we use an adjustable speed drive system. So we have um, then here the, uh, again, power supply. This is the AC uh, supply grid, uh, runs the uh, motor-driven unit. So we have the inverter here, we have um, the uh, motor, and we might have the coupler, or we have also uh, some filters or so. But at the end, what I have, I have adjustable speed. Uh, which means I can run this, the pump with variable speeds and I control basically the flow of the water or the air here in a fan blower uh, application. I control it with the speed. So there is no need for throttling valve. There's no additional losses when I control the flow and I can have a very high efficiency in the whole chain. <clears throat> to give you an idea, on, on what this means. I, I have here, um, let's say, I start with 100% useful power. So there's a certain amount of, of flow I need, being it air or water, and I, I use a, a throttle valve. So I will have losses in the valve, um, and uh, the pump will operate uh, in a reduced uh, operating point. As you can see here, I will lose roughly about um, 60%, as the efficiency of the combination of pump and valve is about 38%. Um, 
Uh, then I have my direct online motor running at uh, constant speed and it's supplied by um, the grid uh, through a transformer with highly sinusoidal voltage and currents. So the efficiency here is quite high, I have 93. So I have lower losses in the motor section, but I have increased losses in the pump and wall section. Uh, I have about 100% output power, I need 285% of input power, or the total efficiency from input to output is about 35%. If I now uh, use a flow regulation via speed control, uh, then you see that actually my motor section now has a uh, transformer as before, but it has additionally the converter with 96%, and I have the motor here, I have it also with 94%. It could be that it's slightly lower because additional frequency losses, but still I would have a rather high efficiency of my motor driven unit here uh, with 89%. And the pump now, as there is no valve, uh, runs actually at an optimized operating point. Um, it has higher efficiency. So if I look now on the total efficiency, um, I will get about 63% uh, of efficiency. Now, <clears throat> to give you an idea why this happens, I, I, I'm trying to, to show you this with the, with the following operating curve. So this is the operating curve for a throttle pump, huh? the energy requirements. Um, this is the flow rate, so uh, how much uh, water per minute or how much liter per hour and this is the head so how much is the total uh, dynamic discharge head you have in meters uh, which is basically also equivalent to the pressure you have to build up and uh, the blue curve is the system curve um, as a function basically uh, with the throttle so the output throttle so we're talking about uh, this here. So if this is completely open, then I will have a characteristics of my system, which is like the blue curve. And the red curve is the um, characteristics of the pump. And as you can see, um, the operating point number one, which is the unthrottled uh, or 100% point, um, is where the two curves meet. So if I want to reduce flow, um, what I do is basically I throttle my system. I, I actually close the output valve throttle and uh, therefore I increase the resistance of the system. Uh, therefore the system curves with here new, new the dashed line. And as you can see, the operating point moves from uh, right to left. Uh, I have lower flow rate, but I have increased the pressure inside my system. Huh? It's like you, you actually close the valve, you increase the pressure. Uh, and now you can look at what is the power consumption of your system as a function of the flow here. Um, normally this is flow rate times head or, or, or pressure. Uh, as you can see, the reduction which we made here from about 100 to let's say roughly 80%, brings only roughly a 3% reduction here in power consumption. The reason is I have reduced the flow, but I have increased the pressure. So I moved basically uh, some of the input power out of the pump. I have lower flow rate, this is clear, but I moved it actually into friction into my valve. So total losses will decrease only 3%. <clears throat> Now, what happens if I look at it with a variable speed uh, pump system? Again, you see here the, the, the full red line is the pump curve. And you see here the full blue line is the system curve. I have again operating point one. Um, and you see this is the 100% point. Now, in an adjustable speed drive system, I will reduce my speed of the pump and therefore the pump uh, and this is a centrifugal pump, characteristics will change. Um, it's able to provide the full flow, but at a lower pressure. Huh? And um, as you can see, there's a new operating point OP2, which is at about 80% of the initial speed. 
at a much lower pressure here. Huh? And if I look now at the uh, required um, power consumption, you will see the green, green yeah. line coming down here. So instead of 100%, I have now 80% but I will have about 50% of power consumption. So that brings uh, uh, energy saving reduction of 50% compared to the 3% which I had before. And, and that's, the, that's the reason why you actually want to use uh, such um, variable speed drive systems. Um, I will just give you an example for now. This is for airflow, uh, like um, ventilation of an office. And um, uh, often, if you look at office, you know, the, the amount of people, um, this is the amount of people over the hours of a day. I'm sorry for the German here. Um, you see that, uh, you know, there's some people that are starting early around uh, 10 to 12. You have uh, most of the people working in the office. Then there's going back to lunch, and then you have again in the afternoon more people and a few work till six o'clock. What does it mean basically for um, the, uh, the requirements for the ventilation of this office building? It means that you can actually overnight reduce uh, your, your uh, um, airflow but you can also modulate basically the required airflow over the day in function of the occupancy of, of people. So um, now reducing the airflow of your ventilation means that the airflow rate uh, is directly a function of the speed of the fan. And as we have before seen, the power is actually um, cubic or third power of the volume flow. So we can actually reduce the power uh, quite a lot when we regulate the volume flow. And uh, this you have to compare to uh, a system where you do just constant air power and you regulate basically also the airflow with a valve. Um, if you would now look at it um, in a system like this, the, the valve in an airflow that would be some, some uh, grids, curtains in front of the uh, the blower or the, 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 the ventilators. Um, in a typical system like that, the, the operating power would be normally about 12, point, 12 kilowatts and total consumption in a system like that would be 130.9. So that would be continuous, uh, always the same airflow. You would use 139 kilowatt hours per day. Now, if I go and I, I will do this now, uh, I will change the speed using a, a frequency inverter. Um, then you actually have uh, the frequency inverter losses. You have still the motor losses. You have still the, um, the ventilator losses here. Um, but as you can see, I can modulate the power consumption during the day. It basically follows the occupancy of the persons. And as you can see here, this is based on, on a real life example, I, I end up with about 43.5 kilowatt hours a day. So um, I only use 33% of, um, of the total energy I use compared with a constant flow. So um, this is uh, one of the real big advantages. You have to look at the requirements, you modulate your, your, um, your production as a function of the requirements, in this case, the occupancy of the, of the offices, and therefore you can really get a lot of, of savings. Huh? So this is a mix of, I would say, system efficiency improvements. Huh? I analyzed basically the occupancy of, of the people, and I said, if I don't need it, then I don't have to uh, ventilate. And additionally, uh, the advantage of having a better efficiency in the motor-driven unit. So instead of uh, just uh, blocking the flow with an output uh, curtain, um, I actually use reduced speed. So there are two, two efficiency measures here, which are quite interesting. So, and for you, uh, if you want to take home, you can also take a little exercise with you. Um, this is the flow rate uh, of a blower again, um, the consumption, you can take this over time, 20% um, it would run at 100% uh, efficient uh, flow rate, 
20% during the day at 80%, 30% during the day 60% flow rate, and 10% at 30% flow rate. And uh, the rest of the day, especially during night, you actually switch it off. Here you have these uh, consumption curves as before. Um, and you see here there are different um, uh, modulation technologies. So electric drive with adjustable speed drive systems, uh, an inlet vane where you basically create an uh, under pressure or an outlet damper where you basically block the air. And um, as you can see, uh, let's take the example of this 80% uh, flow. Huh? That's the 80% flow. Um, if I do this with an outlet damper, I have 95% efficiency. If I use the inlet vane, I have 85% efficiency. If I use electric drive, adjustable speed, then I have about 50% efficiency. So how do I calculate the efficiency gains over a day? Basically, I take the amount of time I have and I multiply it with uh, the, amount, the efficiency gains here. Um, as you can see here for the outlet damper, 20% 100, 20% 95. Huh? Here with the inlet twin is 20% 85, and here you have the 20% times 50. And I go and look at the 60s. Huh? I will make the same uh, graphs here. You can see here at 60, I have 30% of the time times 90% efficiency, 75 and 30. And then I have 10% um, of the time, I'm at 30% of flow, which means 75% for the outlet damper, 70 for the inlet drain, and 10% input power requirement for the adjustable speed drive system. And then you see here the, um, the uh, useful energy per kilowatt hour I, ha I, I have to invest. And as you can see uh, that I really, for the variable speed drive system, I really invest the lowest amount of energy. The savings between a variable frequency drive and the outlet damper is almost 50%. Uh, so that's, that's uh, just a calculation example for you to take home uh, to see how this is done actually. So, and as I promised, roughly one hour and 15 minutes, um, I have the summary here. It's clear that you can do energy savings with each component of your system. You, you can uh, buy the best motor, which is always a good idea. You can buy a highly efficient inverter. You can say, okay, I take, uh, I take uh, regenerative braking if you have a that certain amount of regenerative braking. Um, but the real advantage of energy saving in an adjustable speed drive system is in the optimization of the, the complete or the extended product, which means you look at the motor-driven unit and you look at the, the, um, the system. Um, and, and there you actually see that if you modulate the, uh, let's say the application, like the flow over a day for, for ventilation, you will get the best, uh, the highest amount of efficiency gains. If you look at the components, the electric motors, they're moving towards efficiency classes I4 and higher. Um, I, but I mean, also already I3 has a very good efficiency class and a lot of, uh, let's say, regulators now introduce I3 as mandatory uh, for direct online and the European Union uh, even moving further along this path. Um, the uh, use of a variable frequency drive brings with it an additional loss of about three to four percent and um, it allows uh, to control the, on the other side the driven equipment over a large torque and speed range which means that you really have to look at your application if, if you have the possibility to actually modulate the speed and by gaining efficiency by uh, modulating that speed then the variable frequency drive makes a lot of sen uh, sense if you have a fixed frequency application, uh, adding a variable frequency drive does not make uh, too much sense. There are additional functions um, which you have to look at it, like input filters or output filters. They're actually adding losses to your inverter, uh, but overall in the system, they can actually improve the total system efficiency. So I talked about the higher harmonics losses in the motor due to pulseless modulation from your inverter. If you have an output filter, you will actually improve the efficiency of the motor. 
Um, if you have problems with the input line, because you have additional harmonic losses in the grid, so uh, the regulator can ask you to put some input line filters. From a system point of view, these auxiliaries can improve the efficiency also. If you look too close, only motor or inverter, this can be happen as a dis this can be looked at as a disadvantage. Uh, variable frequency drive driven pumps and fans, they offer actually highest potential for energy savings, uh, especially if they're operated the variable loads, and that's because of the relation which is uh, square for the torque and cubic of, uh, for the power. And as you have seen, uh, just a reduction of 20% of flow will bring you almost 50% of reduction in power, which is um, really possible and often the case uh, in daily application. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm at the end of this presentation. And I think we have about 10 minutes left. Huh? Uh, for questions, if there are any questions, I'm happily uh, here to answer these questions and, and to explain whatever uh, you want to know more in depth. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrea. Yeah, yeah, thank, thank you, Mr. Vezin, for your very good presentation. I think your flow and delivery was very good. Uh, so I have one question here uh, from Sandra Kumar. He is saying, "How to take care of pressure drop in bowlers due to use of VFD at reduced speed?" Okay, how to take uh, care of pressure drop in that? I blow. didn't understand. Blow, blow. In blow. Yeah. Due to yeah. ah. We have sent you a question in chat box. Okay, let me check quickly. Check the chat box. Uh, sorry. Oh, here. Yes, this is a. This comes actually as a as a as a. It depends if it's a problem or not. Uh, also, with uh, if you have um, a, a water pump. If you reduce basically the speed, uh, as you have seen in, in this picture, you have a lower um, pressure in itself, but you're interested not in the pressure, but you're, in press, you're interested in the, in the flow, uh, so the liters per minute. So in a, in a, in a blower, um, this is the same thing. You will have a re a reduced um, pressure, um, which means basically if you're sitting inside the office, you will feel that the air is coming less, less forced out of it. But um, this is not a problem if you're interested in, in volume uh, turnover. Huh? So, um, I, I, yeah, I, I don't know if this is really answering your questions in that sense. Uh, it's difficult to keep, let's put it this way, huh? if, you, if you change the speed of your blower uh, you you will have a reduction in in pressure. That's that's for sure. Yeah, but maybe another benefit is if you reduce the flow. I think maybe the friction of the network also the requirement also reduced. Then you can you know, that means the flow come you know slower flow and also low velocity of the flow will you know, will cut the friction. Fr fr the friction also some other resistance from network. I think it can still reach the which is simple, and also you can use a valve sometimes to control the flow. And also, you can combine sometimes combine the VFT plus a valve and damper to you know, control the flow and pressure. You know, sometimes you cannot use only VFT to control the flow. Yeah, I think I, I my, mean, my understanding. Yeah, then, then I did understand it wrongly. I mean, you have that's for sure. You have a reduction in in pressure, and that's actually a good thing in a lot of of applications. Huh? But I understood. Um, if he wants to maintain the pressure because he needs some, you know, uh, air which brushes over a surface to to get rid of of, of some uh, dirt or so, and and if you have variable speeds, you you will reduce uh, pressure, and and in most cases this is actually an added advantage and increases basically the efficiency in water pumps typically also if you have lower speeds of the water, friction reduces and therefore you can actually have even higher. I agree with you completely. It depends on your goal. Yeah, uh, thank you.
Mr. Wu, you have any question? Yes, actually, maybe not a question because I want, you know, I yesterday I told the audience that when we, you know, when the power systems installed VFD, when we, you know, to reduce, uh, we, if we reduce the uh, frequency of the converter, actually the efficiency of the, you know, the VFD plus the mode will be decreased, but the benefits from the overall decrease of output part requirement, that means the benefit from the end saving of the system, but the component efficiency like VFD and also maybe the motor will be decreased a little bit, but we got the system benefit. My understanding is correct? Yeah, yes, uh, I, the, absolutely. The system benefit, and that's why I, I had these examples at the end, you know, the system benefit is always what you have to keep in mind. Huh? Yeah. As, as I said, yeah, you have an addi add additional losses in motors and inverters, probably, um, most certainly, but the efficiency gains in the system are, are more than compensating. Yeah. yeah, because that's the question, you know, some, some someone proposed yesterday, I said yes, but we got the system benefits. Right now, I got confirmation from you today, so yeah. I think we answered the same question like yesterday. That's good. That's uh, as a teacher, I always think that repetition is the best thing to learn. <laughs> yeah. Okay. 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 Thank you very much, Hugo and India Basin, uh, for your time with us. So we move to the uh, question session. Uh, we'll display the question one by one, uh, and we'll. And get the response from the participant. Uh, I request Mr. Wahab, please. We are moving to the next question. Dear participant, the right answer for this question is a cubic. Okay. Twelve percent. Then move for a second. Next.
The participant, I think we are getting uh, the wrong answer from most of the participants. So this answer is yes. Any more questions? No. No. Uh, thank you, participant, uh, for your response in this MCQ. So now we move to next presenters of the day. So, uh, Mr. Uh, I would like to invite Mr. Liu Ren, CNS, CNIS China, and he will be talking on motor system energy saving best practices from China. Uh, Mr. Liu, are you with us? Hello. Hello, Liuren. Yeah, Liuren? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's here. Uh, okay, Liuren. Uh, you, you are welcome to the. the yeah. Now, you can hear us, Mr. Liu? Hello. Hello, everyone. I can hear you. You can hear now. Okay, 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 okay. Great. Uh, I will share my screen. Mr. Luren, okay. you can start. Yes, I can hear screen. you. Yeah, Sorry. You start. You can start your presentation with your a brief introduction. Yeah.它的开右上角的菜单那边好像就是那个那个那个小商户里边有一个可以分享这个屏幕的一个选项你现在是演示者你可以这个叫做分享那个屏幕了是显示吗啊显示对吗 是在显示，应该显示，应该显示在显示。你再点分享屏幕，然后就分享一个那个。因为我们现在是这个，我们是非演讲者，我们就没办法有这个东西，只有你这个有有个额外的选项。能看到我，能看到我，对吧？能看到
Okay, Tula, you can start the introduction of Dr. Liuren for the audience now. Okay, yeah. Uh, Liuren is an associate uh, researcher from the China National Institute of Standardization, a college CNIS, which is a government institution in China. And Liuren got his doctoral degree from the Beijing Institute of Technology. And he also uh, completed a uh, postdoc at Tsinghua University. His research covers mandatory and voluntary industrial equipment, energy efficiency standard, public quality inspection projects, and national infrastructure projects. He is also active in international collaboration initiatives such as APEC, EGEEC Secretary, and G20 EE Hub Secretary. Before joining CNIS, he worked as a China Quality Certification uh, Center. Okay, Mr. Liu, you may start. You 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 are muted, I think. You are muted, Mr. Liu. Yeah, Dr. Yeah, Dr. Okay. Okay. Uh, thanks, Tuna. Thanks, uh, Mr. Hu. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, hello everyone, uh, this is Susan from China National Institute of Standardization. Uh, I'm very glad to invite, uh, thanks for inviting me to give this presentation about uh, uh, the update of China uh, motor standard and the shared China experiences of uh, energy efficiency standards and uh, labeling program implementation. Mm, it's not uh, strongly to nature to know how to operate a uh, motor system like uh, uh, Mr. Andrea, but I think uh, I want to uh, nature to know how to implement the uh, standard and the labeling program to promote energy efficiency. So I prepared my uh, topic. Uh, this is my uh, presentation. Uh, development and the implementation of uh, uh, energy efficiency standard and enabling program for motor in China. Uh, first, I want to uh, give the uh, update of uh, MAPS and uh, China Energy Enable Program. And, uh, and for MAPS, uh, China mandatory standard was introduced, uh, or re uh, was released uh, in last year, this brand new uh, motor standard. And this year, 2020, uh, and this 2020 version replaced the uh, last version, which was uh, published uh, in 2012. Uh, this 2020 version started from uh, June this year. Uh, this graph. Uh, uh, we can't see your PPT in the front. We can't see your PPT in the front. Now you can see it in the front. We can't see your PPT in the front. It's in the front. It's in the front. I don't know how to do it. It's in the front. It's in the front. 这样吧，你把那个那个演示的前面给我吧，我来看哪看。好的，那我先退出啊，我先退出，你来播。对，我来播吧。OK。呃，稍等啊，我把这个文件打开一下。OK。So，Sorry，everyone，it's my first time to。
。哦，可以了，现在可以了，现在可以了。OK， 然后你叫我翻页，我就翻页啊。好的，现在到第三页了。好嘞。那个吧。没看到翻页。哎，稍等。你看没看到翻页吗？我已经放第三页来了。现在只是全屏没有看到翻页。不应该呀、啊。Hello, Mr. Liu, please go ahead, go ahead. It's it's visible. Yeah, go ahead. 嗯，好了好了好了好了，可以了可以了可以了，可以了。嗯，可以了，胡总。嗯 ，Sorry, everyone. It's my first time to use this. 呃、uh, ，那那。呃，上页，上页，胡总，嗯，上面一页可以翻过去吗？在标准那一页。喂，这第，这是第三页吗？上面一页。嗯。Intro map。上面一页。For maps, yes, yes, yes. Sorry, everyone, sorry. Uh, as for maps, yes, we just published this brand new version, uh, motor standard, and uh, I just compared those two, uh, these two versions, old standard valid until 2021, uh, 2021, uh, the uh, before the June, before June, and the new standard was starting from uh, the uh, first of first day of June. 又变回去了，还是不行。You cannot see， 你看不见我的那个吗？能看见，但是现在是看到的首页。哎，非常奇怪，我看那个，这样吧，我这不搞这个，不搞这一套了，还是看这个吧，就这样看吧，看得见吧？没看见分页。哦，现在看见这个这个页面没有？呃，看见了。好，现在看见了。现在看见了。I'm very sorry about this. Uh, okay. Uh, compare uh two versions. Uh, the scope of standards has been changed, and uh, old standard uh that is the two thousand uh two thousand twenty two version. Uh, apply to normal motors and a single speed, uh, three phase, 50 uh, hertz, and uh, 1000 voltage and below. Uh, include the self tenantal and designed an uh, scroll cage inter uh, induced inter uh, induction motor for uh, continuous uh, duty class uh, H1 to H3. Mm. And uh, uh, expect that in 2000 version standard, uh, single phase motor from uh, uh, point, uh, 0 0.01 to point 0.37 kilowatt and 350, uh, 75 to 1000 kilowatt was uh, enclosed. That is the blue part in this uh, figure. And uh, uh, further, I think the 2000 version was contained uh, eight poles motor and uh, uh, promote minimum energy performance requirements from uh, IE2 to IE3. Uh, I just show this uh, this information in this picture. And uh, then is the grid three in China mandatory standard. Then is GP18613 to uh, dash uh, 2020. Uh, and uh, this grid three uh, is the three is the three shoulder for motor to enter the market uh, in China, and uh, grid two equivalent to IE four, and uh, grid one is the highest uh, one requiring uh, twenty percent less uh, losses compared to IE four, uh, equivalent to IE five. Uh, I think that means the uh, latest version of uh, uh, motor maps covered the broader range of the motor product and uh, gave most strictly requirement for motor uh, in China. Uh, next slide, please.
please next slide. As for label, uh, China Energy label, which usually called the uh, CEL, uh, which defined the rules and the scope, uh, which needed to be uh, registered and uh, uh, marked with uh, China Energy label. Uh, from those two pictures, uh, we can see and uh, we can see then very clearly the scope of the old uh, CEO covered the same as standard scope. And uh, like the left uh, side picture, and the new CEO started this year, uh, June. Uh, the scope is different with the standard scope because in the last version standard, we just, uh, uh, in the latest standard, Mm, we consider the DC motor and those DC motor products will not be required to apply to apply CEL. And the, uh, those uh, graphs in this page was shown as the difference between two versions of uh, uh, China Energy Label and the scope of the uh, new CEL starting from uh, June this year uh, is almost the same as last version. Uh, only eight eight poles motor and uh, the minimum requirements is up to IE three from IE two. Mm. Next slide, please. Mm. Okay, maybe the internet problem, so uh, it will be made to show the show the screen of the presentation. Okay, great. Okay, this page shows the uh, main changes changes of uh, uh, China Motor Energy Efficiency Standard, the latest version, uh, the latest 2020 version. Uh, first, I just uh, uh, like I just mentioned, uh, the scope and the indicator changed. Uh, the scope uh, of the new version uh, energy efficiency standard was covered from uh, 0 0.12 to 1,000 kilowatt, and um, eight poles motor and uh, small power motor added into this new version standard. Uh, three show the indicator from IE2 upgrade to IE3. And uh, another is uh, uh, the target, the target the limited uh, value and uh, energy conservation value. Uh, the original grade two uh, index in 2012 version uh, are canceled and uh, all sentences are uh, mandatory throughout, the, uh, throughout this version standard. Uh, this table shows, uh, in this, uh, this table in this page uh, shows the relations between the GB standard and IEC standard. Um, that is the grade one is equivalent to IE5 uh, in this new version of the GB standard. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, this page shows the uh, similarity and the difference between the IEC and the TV standard. Uh, compared with IEC standard, uh, China mandatory standard have the same uh, indicator values for three uh, phase uh, as Kroner uh, motors, but the frequency control, uh, permanent magnet motor and other type of uh, uh, motor are not considered besides only 50 hertz was considered in China energy label because five, uh, 50 hertz is the uh, is our is our the usually used uh, in the uh, electronic 
uh, and the details and list in this table uh, you can see in this picture but uh, in this slide and uh, uh, the grid one is highest efficiency in China, which corresponded to uh, with IE five, like I just said. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Uh, next, uh, I want to uh, I just uh, introduce the difference and the compare and comparison about uh, with the uh, China energy efficiency standard of motor and uh, the IEC. Uh, energy efficiency standard motor. Uh, I just uh, after this, I want to introduce. Uh, I want to introduce some effect from the maps and the China energy label program. Uh, maps and uh, CEL bring, bring the great effects uh, to motor industry of China. Uh, and at the same time, the motor uh, industry and market in China have witnessed, uh, witnessed uh, the dramatic changes since the first uh, uh, mandatory energy efficiency level standard for motors uh, was enacted in 2002. Uh, what, uh, what I mean is from the 2002, the first version of the energy efficiency standard for motor, in act uh, until now uh, we got a great a great promote in the area of energy efficiency um, pro, uh, promotion uh, and uh, i think the uh, energy efficiency standard playing a very positive role in uh, accelerating energy uh, energy conservation and the uh, emission reduction in China. And uh, next, I want to introduce some changes in energy conservation and emission reduction after GPE standard uh, implementation uh, to illustrate the how the great promotion in China energy efficiency uh, promotion. Um, and uh, moreover, I uh, we'll also introduce how China implement GP standard and the China energy able uh, label system. Mm, next slide, please. Okay, I just uh, I have listed a great impact uh, to multi industry in China uh, from uh, maps and the labeling program implementation. Uh, maps and the China Energy Label program uh, playing an important role, like, like I just said, playing a very important role to promote uh, energy efficiency and energy conservation and the emission reduction. Uh, data uh, from the Ministry of Industry and uh, Information Technology shows that uh, the, according to the statistics during the time of motor, uh, energy efficiency improvement and plan implementation more than 75 million kilowatt higher efficiency motors have been promoted uh, nationwide including over 38 million kilowatt low voltage higher efficiency motor and uh, more than 2.5 billion yuan of uh, special funds for improving motor energy efficiency was given to the uh, motor industry. Uh, kicked out 21.08 million kilowatt in efficiency, uh, in efficient in motors, uh, re renovated 17.1 million kilowatt motors and uh, reproduct 7.91 uh, million kilowatt outdated motor. Uh, annual electricity saving is about 11.3 billion kilowatt hour, equivalent to 1.39 million tons of standard coal and uh, carbon dioxide emission reduction is 3.475 million tons. Uh, I think those uh, data is uh, is is very uh, is a uh, great example to show the how to uh, energy efficiency standard to promote uh, China's uh, energy conservation and uh, emission. Uh, 
Please, next slide. Okay, uh, from uh, uh, 2002 version, then the, the first uh, energy efficiency uh, uh, standard uh, for motor uh, from those days to today. Uh, this slide shows the effect of MAPS and the uh, China Energy Label uh, program, like improvement of motor industry and the change these types uh, and the sorts of uh, uh, industry. Uh, more important, to change the uh, consumer attitude to efficient uh, motor. Um, before customer, uh, you usually choose cheap motor and don't have a uh, um, big willing to update an outdated motor. Uh, in fact, they don't have uh, energy uh, measures. Now changes a lot. Uh, nowadays in China, uh, manufacturers provide a higher efficiency, at least IE3 level. Uh, high efficiency level, uh, high efficiency motor to the customer, and customer have uh, willing to choose the high efficiency uh, uh, motor uh, to use these uh, to use those higher efficiency product and uh, save energy. And um, uh, after those years, from the 2002, we got a lot of energy efficiency and energy convert, uh, conservation. The emission uh, progress uh, from uh, those manufacturers and the customer choose to uh, choose to uh, produce those high efficiency program and uh, choose the efficient motors uh, and those activity update uh, uh, outdated motors. We got uh, uh, a lot of uh, energy conservation. Okay, please next slide. Mm, okay, next I want to briefly review the maps and, uh, and the China energy label in China and introduce the introduce bar and barriers of uh, China in uh, maps and the uh, energy label program. Uh, please, next. Uh, over the last 20 years, uh, at least 20 years from 20, uh, 2002, and uh, with growing uh, policy uh, emphasized on improving energy efficiency and uh, reducing uh, environment polluting and uh, carbon emission, China has implemented uh, uh, maps and uh, mandatory and uh, voluntary energy labels to improve the energy efficiency. Uh, so uh, the first bench uh, from those uh, from the uh, 20 years ago, the first bench of minimum energy performance standards, uh, that is MAPS, was adopted in uh, 1989, and the motor MAPS start, uh, started from 2002, like I just said, and the um, and this standard got uh, the revi got revised three times uh, in 2006, 2012, and 2020. Uh, and the national level, NDRC, uh, National Development and uh, Development and uh, uh, the uh, NDRC and MIT and uh, ACMR put forward the requirements. Uh, put many uh, put forward many requirements to set the uh, to set and uh, the, uh, and the revisions of national mandatory efficiency energy efficiency standards uh, and the market uh, and the management level yes manage, national management level is is taking charge of uh, standard uh, setting progress and the work level. Uh, technical committee respond for uh, standard draft. Uh, China currently have uh, uh, more than 470 technical committees with the National uh, Energy Foundation and the management of uh, um, standardization uh, technical committee. Uh, that is short for TC20, responsive, uh, responsible for 
uh, the energy efficiency standard and the uh, secretary of uh, the TC20 is lo located in uh, China National Institute of Standardization and the committee is responsible for uh, maps and uh, rational use of uh, energy standard and uh, energy management standards. Uh, TC20 is composed uh, uh, of uh, the uh, representatives from uh, key government uh, agencies, uh, research institutes, and uh, uh, some experts from uh, uh, the industrial associations, uh, leading university and uh, uh, industrial enterprise, uh, enterprises. Uh, all uh, some experts from those group to uh, compose the TC20 and uh, draft the energy efficiency standards. Um, so it's very uh, rational. Uh, that is a very rational uh, standard. Of course, we have some bar uh, barriers, like I just showed in this page, uh, in this slide. Uh, maps cannot update uh, in timely, I think, is uh, the mostly, most important barriers uh, nowadays for energy efficiency uh, standard for motors. Uh, I just uh, show in this page like the slow updating standard. Uh, modern energy efficiency standard valid uh, uh, almost 80 years from last version to this version. Uh, during those years, uh, a bunch of energy efficiency technologies uh, emerged and uh, being used by customer and uh, produced by uh, many manufacturers of motor. Uh, but without energy efficiency requirement. So I think this slow updating standard is the most important, uh, most uh, heavy barriers uh, nowadays. And uh, uh, another like indicator setting principle is too much, uh, too much simple and uh, don't consider system match. Uh, is another important uh, Problem. Uh, this version standard of energy efficiency for motor uh, still only considered energy efficiency. Um, maybe next time we revised the energy efficiency standard, we will consider the energy efficiency uh, of the motor system. Um, and uh, the um, I think another biggest uh, big uh, big uh, the barrier is the. Uh, is MAPS uh, supervision. Uh, we uh, got a lot of information from the market and uh, 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 we know that we don't have, uh, we have insufficient market uh, regulatory. Uh, so some uh, uh, small manufacturers will uh, produce some uh, products uh, cannot meet the minimum energy efficiency requirement. Uh, and uh, the, those small manufacturers still make products uh, low energy efficiency, uh, but they cannot uh, supervise. So I think the supervise is uh, important. And uh, uh, nowadays, the big barrier is the MAP supervision. Uh, this kind of behavior uh, will impact uh, on the market a lot. Uh, the next slide. Mm, okay, the next slide I want you to see uh, in the future. Further, I think MAPS indicator setting has limited members uh, particip participation and uh, the uh, NGO or foreign expert cannot join uh, and uh, MAPS and uh, Challenger label uh, have unstable and the insufficient support from government and uh, government subsidy, especially from uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, government cut standard budget almost in half, so it's hard time for us to draft the energy efficiency standard because we will spend a lot of money and uh, we spend a lot of uh, time to um, collect data and um, to draft and to revise the energy efficiency standard. Uh, so I think the future 
um, even we have those barriers, we still go the go to the hit future, and uh, we still require to to got a lot of food fruitful results. So uh, we think we will break through those barriers. Uh, in our view, MAPS uh, uh, means a lot, at least means lower energy uh, cost and uh, uh, lower emission. Mm, and MAPS should not act uh, as a barrier to market entry and uh, affect uh, fair competition. So uh, they, this version of the energy efficiency uh, standard aim of uh, any MAPS have to improve the energy efficiency. Uh, while well, harmonization of regulation is a uh, um, whole while goal, and then the primary object of MAPS is to uh, ensure energy efficiency, and the MAPS should not act uh, a barrier, like I said, uh, act as a barrier to market entry or a fair, uh, affect the fair competition. So we still um, enhance the uh, standard. Uh, supervision and uh, maps should consider the ecological in the future. Uh, this version we don't consider. It. So uh, in the future, maps should consider uh, ecological uh, justification, especially several energy efficiency initiative uh, are going uh, are ongoing with regard to. Uh, motors and uh, other equipment such as pumps and uh, compressor uh, to got the um, more energy conservation. Mm, please next slide. Mm, so based on uh, I based on that we in the future we will consider the full full life cycle uh, progress of motor manufacturers and uh, more. Uh, motor and motor system is very important to get uh, to get more energy conservation. Like I just said, in the future, we will consider that, and uh, we hope cooperate and uh, uh, coordinate international standard uh, breaks the import uh, breaks the import and export barrier uh, and uh, promote motor system energy efficiency and. Uh, Mm, to make the to make or to achieve peak carbon dioxide emission by 2030 and uh, achieve the uh, uh, carbon neutrality by 2016. And um, yes, uh, this year is the first year of the China 14 five, uh, five years plan. So we will all use uh, we will. Uh, use this energy efficiency standard of motor to promote energy efficiency in the next five years uh, to got a, a more energy conservation and uh, lower uh, emission. Uh, so next slide, please. Okay, great. Thanks for your listening, and uh, please contact me if you have any questions about the energy efficiency, how to uh, draft the energy efficiency in. Uh, standard in China and uh, um, how to implement uh, China Energy Efficiency Label uh, for the uh, for motor in China. Please contact me if you have any questions. Thank you so much. Thanks, Lirian, because I have some more remarks for that because I was told by Tula that we are going to have some policy makers government offices from the Southeast region. That's why we plan. That's why we, you know, why we invited the policy making for, uh, policy maker from China, like Sinis, and also the class working for the policy level to share the experience and think because Dr. Liu Zhen takes the lead in developing the China motor standards. And also he's in charge of a series of industrial equipment maps and also standards. So if you think in future, if we have some cooperation, so feel free to contact us. And also, maybe think after this uh, webinar, I think the SARC and its center and cities, and also maybe the class can establish the initial contact. And then, next phase, we can work further in, the, in this field. I, right now, I found Collins here. So, I will give my present team role to Tula, and then you can introduce Colin. And also, because Colin is from US. And it's quite early today for him. It's about 
6 o'clock a.m. In, in, in the U.S. time. So I appreciate all his efforts, you know, to wake up early. And of course, you have sun. Okay, I will yeah. give my floor to Tula. So Tula, you can, you can start the introduction and then, okay? Yeah. Okay, Mr. Wu. Uh, I want to thank to Mr. Liu for your presentation. I think China standard and Chinese practice uh, will be very beneficial for our South Asian countries because we don't have uh, uh, more this standard and practice like uh, China. Um, India has its own this regulation on the motor uh, and the standard and the rest of the countries are I think lacking. So with that, we want to the last presenters of the day that is uh, is already there, Mr. Colin Taylor. And he will be presenting on motor saving potential in different scenario. Uh, Mr. Poling is a manager on the climate uh, team, uh, leading impacts modeling and financial mechanism to support market transformation uh, for cooling. He also BA in international politics and economics from Middlebury College and in EMA in international. Uh, economics and energy resources and environmental from John Hopkins University School of Advanced International uh, Studies. So, uh, Mr. Taylor, you are welcome. The another corner of your country, the South region, Asia region. So, you may go with the presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. And let me go ahead and. Uh share my screen. Is uh, everyone able to see my screen? Sir, uh, yes, your screen is visible. You may continue now. Okay, great. So uh, I will focus on especially how we uh, at class have been modeling uh, motor scenarios and we have a tool that we can allow uh, that, that's freely available online that can be used by anyone uh, around the world to model motor scenarios and come up with uh, the impacts from different policies, uh, from motors and from other products. So this tool is called MEPSI. It's a Appliant and Equipment Climate Impact Calculator tool. It currently covers actually seven products, uh, space heating, air conditioning, uh, refrigerator freezers, electric motors, ceiling fans, uh, ceiling and portable fans, televisions, uh, and lighting. And soon it will also cover refrigerated display cases, uh, residential hot water heaters, and transformers. This uh, covers 162 countries, 75% uh, of global residential and commercial energy use, and 50% of global electricity use by industry. So I think it has a fairly broad product coverage and uh, can, can definitely be applied to many of the most important products uh, in any given country. Uh, the reason we developed MEPSI is we found that there was a gap between the uh, types of tools available. Uh, sorry, one second. One second. Had an issue with screen sharing. We cannot see your screen. Okay, right now we can see your screen. Okay. okay. I'm not. I'm not quite as used to a uh, go to webinar. Sorry about that. So uh, the reason we developed MEPSI is that we found that there was a gap between the tools existing already in the market, um, where, uh, you know, sorry, I'm again having a problem with the screen share. Okay, between uh, detailed national models and larger global models, uh, there was nothing really to bridge that gap. And a lot of the models uh, available out there were not uh, usable by everyone. They weren't free. Uh, you had to pay someone to run the model for you. Um, they weren't customizable. And so uh, we felt that it was good to fill this gap by providing a free tool available to everyone that was highly customizable. Uh, flexible, transparent, and uh, up-to-date and immediately usable 
for everything from identifying opportunities across countries to prioritizing among products within a country to doing detailed uh, analysis within a single country on a single product. So uh, why does MEPSI have these features and not others? So it has some great uh, visuals that you can see on the first screen and I can send the link to everyone so that you can access this online. Uh, it can reproduce some of the most common graphics and outputs that we use at CLASP um, to demonstrate different uh, scenarios of, of savings potential. You can generate custom outputs by downloading model results and uh, you know, developing different graphs and then of course you can prioritize uh, among different products, you can analyze different scenarios and you can analyze the different uh, cost benefit paybacks and metric tons of CO2 savings from different policy scenarios. So how can MEPSI help? It can help uh, review and prioritize opportunities in your country, experimenting with different efficiency levels to see impacts uh, you can leverage publicly available data, you can input your own data, or you can use the data that's already loaded into uh, MEPSI online. You can download your results and create a supporting analysis as well. Um, researchers also can compare the benefits of different policies and conduct different analyses. And of course, uh, you know, donors uh, interested in choosing which countries they want to invest in to try to save a, a carbon emissions can use it as well to, to prioritize among countries. So what's the methodology? It's a bottom-up model, a stock accounting model where we use the sales in order to uh, accumulate stock over the lifetime of the product and then you know uh, retire stock as they would retire over the lifetime. It uses a a uh, normal uh, weighable distribution for uh, most of the products. There's a different S-curve uh, survival function for lighting, given that uh, many lighting products uh, go out of service much earlier and then ones that last longer, last longer. Um, it multiplies the stock of these appliances by the unit energy consumption under different scenarios and then factors in grid losses, power plant emissions, and electricity rates to finally calculate cost and carbon emissions. And we validated these results with other models. Uh, on the bottom right, you can see the comparison in 2030 between uh, what we found for air conditioning and spe space heating using MEPSI versus what the IEA found. And there were some you know, uh, differences. We found a lot less space heating in the Southeast Asian region than IEA. But otherwise, uh, generally, they fall um, very closely along the same line. Um, you can see, for example, uh, India, not much space heating, but India's air conditioning energy consumption is almost exactly the same as what IEA found. So where does the data come from? And it's important to be transparent that this data is uh, you know, probably good enough to do an initial cut of analysis to prioritize among products. But if you're doing specific policy analysis, you would want to use your own data um, from your country in order to make sure that it's more uh, robust and more suited to your situation. So we got shipments in stock from various market research companies and data from, uh, in some cases where smaller countries, we didn't have data, we extrapolated from key neighboring countries to others. Um, we got consumer and national interest rates uh, from the World Bank, we got transmission and distribution losses from the World Bank and the IEA, carbon emissions factors from the IEA, heat rates from the IEA, electricity prices from the IEA, uh, lifetimes from different market assessments and manufacturers, and then finally the, the macroeconomic data we got from a variety of sources. So for motors specifically, um, I think this will highlight also how uh, you know, it'll be important to get your own data to do more detailed analysis for each country. The representative unit we have is an 11.4 kW eight pole uh, motor that uh, was based on a motor for centrifugal pumps that was based on the stock weighted worldwide average of medium and large motors. So I think instead of doing a single scenario like that, if you're planning to design policies based on MEPSI's outputs, 
you may want to do a couple of representative or even three or four different representative models in order to make it more granular and more specific to your country's case and what the products that are actually in the market. Uh, the shipments we got from Omdia uh, for shipments for centrifugal pumps, compressors, and industrial fans in 2020, and then their projections out to 2023. The efficiency baseline is that products meet the MEPS requirements in the country uh, where we're analyzing. In countries with no MEPS, we set the baseline at one percentage point below IE1. Uh, countries with MEPS already at IE3, uh, we for our efficiency case scenario, we did MEPS at halfway between IE3 and IE4 and the best available technology at IE4. I think this actually needs to be updated. I think that IE5 motors may exist in some markets, even though they're not very common. Um, and then finally, for usage, we estimated running at 62% capacity for 3,280 hours annually and the uh, average motor lifetime for 7.7 .7 years. Again, every one of these inputs is customizable. So if you have data uh, that this is not entirely accurate for your country, by all means, uh, put that data in because this is meant to be used for just a first cut analysis and more accurate data would be better to do deeper analysis within METSI. Uh, just to give an idea of what the screen uh, at first shows, you have a map of the world where you can click on different economies and you can compare uh, from the beginning just a what the world energy consumption by product is across here. You can see actually space heating is the largest and then motors here, this line is the second largest consuming um, thousands of terawatt hours, about seven to 8,000 terawatt hours uh, every year. And then you can compare between countries. So, you know, the top two energy consuming countries are the US and China, uh, for example. You can get a closer look here at where electric motor stands with a rising consumption um, and being the second most energy consuming product in the world. Again, the, the country comparison. And then we can look at specific countries. So if we pick, uh, this is Sri Lanka, uh, we can find that electric motors consumption is fairly flat at around four terawatt hours whereas air conditioners is uh, growing very rapidly and is a higher consuming product. And then the others contained in METSI are, are significantly lower than either. Uh, another thing that you can do uh, from the main screen in METSI is you can click on a country, uh, say Nepal, and run detailed analysis. And also when you click on a country and have chosen a product, it will give the current energy consumption. So what we've estimated is Nepal's energy consumption from electric motors is 1.4 terawatt hours in 2020. So how to conduct custom analysis in METSI? And I think that's probably the most important thing to try out different scenarios. So uh, first you get this screen uh, here where you have several choices um, and we'll go through each one of those. First, uh, it's important to pick the country of analysis and then the appliance type. So here I've chosen India and I've chosen electric motors. Then you would just adjust the analysis period and the policy effective years. So if you want to anal analyze a policy through 2030 um, that you might implement in 2022, you would choose those here. And that's what I've chosen. And then again, uh, optional parameters. So where you have other data that you can include, uh, such as shipment data, equipment data, economic data, energy sector data, or used appliance market data, you can click on these and then it will give you uh, other areas where you can enter those inputs. So for shipment data, you, get, I can, you can either copy paste into the table or upload a CSV attachment. And that will make the analysis more accurate to your country because it will, instead of having the general data that we've bought um, and input into the model, you would have the more accurate and more up-to-date data uh, for your country specifically. So you can get these sorts of data um, from customs in countries where uh, motors are primarily imported 
or there can be surveys or interviews with industry regarding volumes of sales, or you can uh, commission a market research report. The next one is uh, the equipment data, and I think this is one of the more important ones, is uh, first, uh, equipment lifetime. Again, we've put in 7.72 .7 years. That's a very rough average of you know, all motors worldwide. I'm sure it varies quite a bit more than that. And so you would probably want to customize that uh, based on the lifetime of motors in your market. And you can find this from interviews or surveys or academic research. Uh, the other one is to modify price and annual energy consumption for each scenario, both the business as usual, the efficiency policy scenario. And if you want to look at what the total potential is, uh, you can also do a best available technology scenario. And the unit energy consumption is calculated based on the size of the model, uh, size of the motor, its efficiency, so you would have to factor in whatever the losses are uh, from inefficiency or, or you know, non-useful non energy losses, uh, then the usage hours for the year, and then the capacity, the average capacity for the year. And you can then, based on those four factors, calculate the annual unit energy consumption, which is what go in here. The other thing is uh, for looking at payback periods and life cycle costs, it's important to input the price. As for here, we didn't have price data at all, so we just left that out. And so our uh, payback periods and life cycle cost analysis in the initial cut of MEPSI without any custom data are not very accurate because they have a price of zero, which of course is incorrect. And then finally, you can change the currency for the inputs and outputs. So I've chosen Indian rupees, um, but it can also be done in US dollars if that's what you prefer. Uh, and it does, you know, it's Indian rupees for India um, if you want to choose a different currency. Uh, if you want to choose your national currency, that's always possible. For economic uh, and energy sector assumptions, um, again, there's the electricity price, heat rate. Uh, TND loss factor, emissions factor, uh, heating fuel price is not relevant for motors. And these can often be found from utilities, energy ministries and departments and reports from uh, organizations like IEA. And then on the right, we have economic data. Uh, so you can adjust the consumer discount rate for life cycle cost analysis. And then this is what you get at the end once uh, once you've run this scenario and, and uh, put in all those inputs. And we can find that, you know, uh, the life cycle operating cost of motors gets better as efficiency improves. Um, no surprise there, especially when you're not factoring in a higher purchase price. And uh, from here, what you can do is you can download the model results. If you want to do additional analysis on top of that, you can return to inputs and change what the uh, what the assumptions that you've included are in order to see how that might change or to conduct the sensitivity analysis. And you can return to the global view in order to try a different product or, or look at what the analysis might be in a different country. And so that that's all uh, I have. Um, and so I'll hand it over for questions at this point. So thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Taylor, for your good presentation. I think you covered lots of key important things that more regarding uh, model of the uh, motor and how to get data. I know about this, uh, how to calculate or the MEPC calculator. So, uh, Mr. Taylor, this. Uh, all sort of calculations are freely available, or we have to buy this MEPSI? It's it's okay. freely available. Uh -huh. And let me just put the link right in. Uh, I, I sent we, it in the chat. We, we have that can... link, no problem. We have that okay. link. Yeah. Okay. So for uh, yeah, for the information of participant, we have uploaded this link uh, in the our website as well as here in the. Yes, out uh, section you can see on the web, webinar uh, control box. So uh, within 
that that uh, within word file you can find it at uh, serial number five. So it's freely available. Yes, yes, it's freely available to everyone, um, as are the methodology and assumptions. So it's uh, it's meant to be a, a service for for policymakers around the world to have a usable model in order to calculate uh, policy impact. And we want it to be completely transparent. So we've also uploaded all of the assumptions and methodology included. Yeah, maybe some comments from my side because I designed this session, this slot for the you know, government offices, for the policymakers, even for the for the SARC and center because class B is an international NGO based in US and also it has an office in Pakistan, also in India. I think they operate with Pakistan also the Indian policymakers for a long time, but I think in future, in the future, I think in near future, they can also provide you know, support for the you know for the South Asia region level cooperation in standard labels and also like and savings for motors and also for for appliances, even for the off grid products. Like I think off grid can be a very important topic. That means for we use solar panel to generate power because we don't have a great connection. And then we can use off the solar panel to generate the power and then we can store this battery stored it. Then it can also use kind of lighting bulbs, refrigerator, and even small motors for the for living, also irrigation. I think that's also quite important for the South Asia region. Not only, I think that's uh, that's why we introduced class to the audience from the South Asia region. Okay. Okay. So. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Taylor, so for your time with us. We can wrap up. Yes. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Today. So thank you all the audience uh, for being with us. So tomorrow we'll again join at uh, 1400 hour PST until then. Bye. <laughs> yeah, tomorrow it's, it's my solo session. So I will give you all something in detail, something technical, something behind the you know behind the software stuff like this. So I hope that you can join can join you for the session tomorrow, I think, afternoon. Okay, bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye.